few questions. Um, the first one kind of goes to Meredith. Uh, a question about the photos of the Kalmintha and the Lobelia. What what months were those taken? Those photographs taken that you showed us earlier. That would have been in late August, um, probably late August, early September. Yeah, the Kalamantha starts, and this is one of those tools that when we get the bloom, the bloom calendar up on the website, it'll be wonderful. The Kalamantha starts in late summer and just goes all the way until frost. So it could have been um, as early as mid-August, um, early mid-August, I would say. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at the exact date, but a lot of people, a lot of gardeners, we struggle with um, the heat of late summer, and we feel like our garden is sort of um, past its prime, if you will, and Pete has become a master at, that's actually, you know, we scheduled our grand opening at the end of August because he said the garden will be at its peak at that time. So um, late August and September are actually the peak of this garden. So you can come down to Belle Isle after, you know, come down to Belle Isle on a Saturday morning um, before you go to Eastern Market afterwards and you can get like totally reinvigorated of what should I be adding to my late summer garden. Uh, Richard, I know you guys mentioned that there's going to be a wet meadow restoration. What all will that entail? Is that going to be another design by Pete, Pete Udolph, or is that something completely different? It It is uh, all, everything in that area and that we're responsible for will have Pete's hand and mind involved. It is um, going to be a little different type of design, though, because... Um, we are uh, not going to see the same kinds of layouts that you saw on those beautiful A, B, and C drawings with uh, plants carefully delineated in, in this case. And Meredith, you'll um, correct me if there is a better way to say this, but uh, because of the topography and changing and uh, changes in the topography with uh, shallow bowls here and there through the wet meadows, there are plants that are so specifically adapted to um, every little rise in the topography and over a great amount of time, nature would fill that with those native plants. We're in a hurry and we want to get that um, taken care of in, in far more uh, shorter time than a, a few 10,000 years. So um, what we will do is um, over what has already happened is that um, in the process of getting rid of in, uh, the invasive alien species, um, many of them you already are, are familiar with, we are all, um, we still have some of that to do, but we were able to already have a mix of native sedges spread over the whole area. And those sedges will be the matrix for the wet meadows. And um, then after we are, if, if we are, and, and as we imagine we will be successful in, in eliminating the invasives, then in 2023, and Meredith re referred to this, we'll be planting the forbs um, or the flowering plants. And those will still be in designed by percentage rather than exact placement, because without Pete on site, um, given that he's in the Netherlands, um, and he trusts us to be able to make those decisions exactly where the best probability for any certain plants to survive uh, will go. So that's, that's how we'll be working that. Would you add anything to that, Meredith? Um, there are also rushes in that initial seed mix, the sedges and rushes. And that was pretty much it. I think probably when we do the Forbes, we'll be doing a lot of plant plugs, um, small, you know, very young plants then that to help them get established, hopefully fairly quickly. And we're going to plant in midsummer, I believe, 2023, the best timing. The team will be looking at um, what what is the water? What are those areas of water doing? Um, that's supposed to be the driest quote unquote time of year to be able to get those plants established. Yeah. So, but it'll be very, like Richard said, very loose, very more wild looking. Um, mm -hmm. We're already looking at um, plant lists that are appropriate for down there. 
think think things like um, Joe Pyweed, um, uh, gosh, Swamp Mallow, Swamp Milkweed, uh, lots of those, all of those special native plants that we know that we see in ditches or that we know do well in you know, blue, blue flag iris, you know, all these different things that do well in those fluctuating water levels. Yeah. Which can also take uh, periods of great drought. Right. There are times when it's just extremely dry. Now we do have irrigation. We went when we installed the irrigation, we put irrigation down there in case there was a drought, we could get those plants established and keep them going mm -hmm. um, until they reach their, their normal cycle because all of those plants are adapted to the uh, to the wet and the dry cycles yes. of, of the year and over time even over periods of years well one other thing that would probably be very interesting to people is um and there are some maths already down there but uh, they um if conditions are wet and we are able to go ahead and plant anyway we may be using core or the coconut fiber mats or jute, either one is, is good, uh, which allows the seeds to germinate and then the roots to take hold and a little wetter area than what they might want to do otherwise. So right. that'll be fascinating. And we do have a couple, you know, very dry areas too, where some of the asters will take, uh, be able to grow nicely and uh, some asters already are. One other, I think fascinating, Thing to me, I'd love to pass on is that um, our um, specialist has already seen um, some other things coming up. When we scraped that area out in order to provide room for the uh, land that we were raising up and displacing floodplain, you can't just send the problem downstream. You have to contain it within the area you're responsible for. So we scraped out some shallow bowls. Well, in that scraping, what's happened is um, ancient seed banks have been uncovered. So we don't know what may yet come up, but there already have been some sedges that we hadn't planned for that were there a long, long time ago. We're kind of excited about that as well. Yeah. Yeah, Lake Plain Prairie Seed Bank, Shannon's really looking forward to seeing what we see. And I think we've already had six different types of aster. The One of the first things the team did is do an inventory of what is going on down there. Just what's going on down there? What are all the different species already growing? So that we knew what we had to deal with, with some invasives that Richard mentioned, but also what is sort, sort of setting the um, starting point, if you will. We And, and it, it just goes on as well be with um, just trying to control the, um, the, the invasives. Um, just these just on Friday, I had a small team of people who went around that area and gathered three bagfuls of thistle heads that had not yet split open. Um, and, and, and in doing so saved us innumerable hours of weeding across the wet meadows and across the, the garden beds, the 15 garden beds that um, were are part of the, uh, the, the, the larger or the raised garden. So um, that will, you know, there, there's no cruise control on uh, keeping invasive species out. That will always be a, an issue. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a great way to learn and to learn about things that you may be dealing with in your own gardens. Um, we are looking forward to more of you signing up to volunteer to help us with this effort. And then, uh, we had a question about, uh, are you open all year, including the winter? Is there anything Great to question. see during the winter? And do you have to ever cut your plants back? Great questions. Yeah. Um, Pete's philosophy is four season year round gardening. This is a, or at least not, maybe not the physical act of gardening, but enjoyment of the garden. And um, the garden is open free any time that Belle Isle is open. And um, there, this year is the last year for the Detroit Grand Prix. Um, that is getting set up, set up is starting for the Detroit Grand Prix right now. The garden has a little bit of access issue. Um, the very, right around Memorial Day, right before the Grand Prix, but we're working with Grand Prix folks to even allow us ADA accessible access to the garden every day that the conservatory and aquarium are open. So even right up until that race weekend, the garden will be open. 
Um, but yes, all year round, just like in the end of the little video we just saw, we saw that time lapse of Lurie Garden um, going through all of the seasons out of Garden Detroit. All of the plants are left intact and upright uh, in the garden all the way through fall. They go all the way through completing their growth cycle. They go into dormancy. Um, a lot of the, some of the plants that remain standing that have real strong structure and beautiful color actually end up holding snow in winter. It's truly, truly beautiful and um, very quiet out there, very serene. And we had a gentleman who did, um, who cleared pathways on big snow days um, this past winter we realized oh my gosh we have to do some we have to clear snow so our team um, scrambled to find a wonderful person to help with that um, and there were footprints uh, i think richard remembers seeing all kinds of footprints throughout all of the pathways all winter long so um, it's very quiet and peaceful and wonderful in winter and yes uh, we actually do our um, the cutback of the garden in very late winter very early spring because we're trying to leave that beautiful four season garden structure as long as humanly possible, right before the crocus bulbs, right before the bulbs start blooming. So, um, and we had, and then we basically cut all of the garden down. This year we did it all by hand with using some, um, a couple of mowers to help with mulching leaves that we leave all of the material in place in the garden, which then becomes sort of a living mulch um, to help feed organic matter into the soil every year. So, so yeah, it's all staying put as long as, as long as possible out there on the island and free for the public. And then Richard, I'm going to give the last question to you. Um, what is coming up right now and what is there to see that we should run over there tomorrow and catch for the last half of our weekend? Oh, I tell you, uh, Amanda, um, what is really wowing people now is the uh, pulsatilla vulgaris, which is pasque flower. If you're not familiar with it, it is a, a very luscious um, open purple flower. It's in the ranuncle, ranunculus family, which is a buttercup. And um, it's, it's truly beautiful. It comes up very, very furry, covered with hairs, which probably help to um, keep heat in the plant. And uh, since it comes up so early, pasque, P-A-S-Q-U-E is a, a word that means Easter. Um, some of you may be familiar with that. And that's a plant that always blooms um, around Easter. It's one of our plants that is not a native. And as Pete designs in worldwide communities uh, and as he designs around the world, um, he uses plants from everywhere as long as they can live together in community, just mm -hmm. what we expect in our own societies. And um, the past flower is a, is a really showy thing at the moment. You, you can't ever just go for the showy thing, though. We have been so surprised, even following the cutback, how the, um, the, the uh, little stem um, uh, the little blue stem grasses <laughs> have given so much color and the, the Siberian irises yeah. have given so much color with their dormant leaves, even cut in clumps um, for the new, the, the little bulbs that are coming up. And there are lots of little bulbs. The, the species tulips are, are small. They're not large. And the, the, uh, tul the, the narcissus that he gave us are, um, none of them are, are very tall species speed or right. selections um but they're they're beautiful in their clumps and the gardens really come alive yeah that's the thing too richard it's so fun every time we're there we are running around looking at every little thing coming out of the ground just like we all do in our own gardens you're looking for your friends you know <laughs> and trying to yeah. identify it's like another way to teach ourselves about the life cycle of these plants is that we're looking for where they're peeking out of the ground. What is that? Who is that? You know, um, and then sometimes resorting to our map or whatever, um, because we're forgetting maybe exactly what it looks like at that very early stage. But there's, gosh, 180 different species. It's a real plant lab going on out there. It's a lot of fun. It, it is. It really is. And now we're also um, we're also getting um, to know the seedlings. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, the, the Scylla seedlings from the Scylla that bloomed last year are, are coming up with a little tiny 
onion-like um, sprouts and uh, the uh, echinacea, the globe thistle, um, the the uh, that yeah. are coming up, the seedlings of those that Meredith found the other day, uh, <laughs> and, and several other things. Uh, some of the some of the mints that are are sowing into the walkways. So uh, there's a lot, you know, like like Jurassic Park, you cannot contain life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very exciting exactly. to see it exploding. Well, thank you so much for speaking for us today. And thank you for, for fostering this great project in Detroit. We really appreciate what it's brought to our community. Um, and I think I will turn things back over to Sally. Thank you, Meredith and Richard, for such an inspiring presentation on the design and planting of the out of garden. Several of us had the opportunity to meet Pete a few years ago when he was at the Detroit Institute of Arts, and it was thrilling, and it's even more thrilling to see what you're doing. I'd like to give a huge thanks to all of our speakers today. What a wonderful day. They provided another informative and exciting day of learning for the ninth annual garden conference. If you're a master gardener, you may count today's presentation as five hours of continuing education. Huge thanks to our outstanding conference committee who brought this program to you today and is already working hard on our 2023 education conference. Special thanks to the ma magicians behind the scene, our AV crew, Amanda Corrin, Chuck Truza, our president, Lucy Probst, and Margie Truza, who helped bring this information and beautiful images to the big screen. We could not have managed this virtual conference without the professional expertise and support of Executive Director Ian Locke and the production crew and staff at Orion Neighborhood Television. We have had so much fun with you. It's been a pleasure. We invite you to visit our website, www.mgsoc.org, and join us on the second Tuesday of each month for our Master Gardener General Meetings. You may continue your quest for more horticultural education there. And each month we have various speakers with outstanding information. Our society is the largest in the state of Michigan and offers a variety of trips, tours, and educational events throughout the year. If you're interested in becoming an Extension Master Gardener, check the information provided in the handout material you received today. If you're already a Master Gardener and interested in joining our society, Information and an application can be found on our website. Special thanks to our two fabulous sponsors, Proven Winners, one of the finest plant developers in the country, and Picnic's Garden Gate for the lovely arrangements that decorate our stage. Please take a minute and complete your online survey. Your ideas help us improve the conference from year to year. Give us ideas about your favorite topic or educator and help us gauge our success. There's a link to the online survey in your handout and on today's website. This conference has been recorded and will be available for two weeks after today for you to go back and review. Part of it, all of it, it's all up there. Follow the instructions that have been provided in your packet. Our tentative date for next year's 10th annual spring conference is April 29th. Mark your calendar, stay safe, and we'll see you again in a beautiful garden somewhere. Thank you.